Hey everyone, so I am going to dig into Facebook and Google Ad Best Practices. Um, the reason we've kind of looking at Facebook, and the, when I refer to Facebook here, it's also on the assumption that Instagram is included in that as well and Messenger accordingly, but these tend to be the two big channels that people end up diving into first and foremost. These are the ones people want to get their customers from. And the first key thing that you always want to think about with either of these channels is setting up your tracking. So it's always uh, like the first thing I do, whether it's client work, whether it's any any kind of course, the first thing I try to get people to do is set up their tracking. And one of the best ways to do that is by using Google Tag Manager. If you haven't used it before, I'd highly recommend checking it out. The image here on the right hand side of my screen is a screen grab from that. It just gives you um, an idea into the different trigger types that are within um, Google Tag Manager. So you can track things like a page view, if you have you know, if people hit a thank you page, if someone clicks on a certain element, everything right down to scroll depth, whether they're watching a video. Um, it, this will give you the opportunity to see your results. More importantly, especially at the beginning, it gives the trackers the opportunity to learn about your customers. So I would always recommend having your tracking set up, even if you're not ready for paid advertising yet, because your trackers are going to learn about people regardless. So as your if your trackers are on your site, at least when you do start your paid advertising, you get started on the right foot as opposed to being on the back foot and setting up your trackers. And it just gives you a little bit of a retrospective data bank uh, for the trackers. So always set those up um, regardless of whether you're advertising or not. Um, I'd highly recommend checking out Google Tag Manager for that as well. The next thing to think about then um, on the back of Google Tag Manager, I guess, is your data. So this is an example. This is a screenshot from Facebook ads. And as you can see here, it's split into two, your sources and Facebook sources. So this gives you the opportunity to create custom audiences, create lookalikes off those, and to also implement data from Facebook sources. The two key things that you need to remember about this data at this point in time after the iOS 14 update and Android is due to follow. So going into next year and the year after, you can work on the assumption that it's going to be privacy first across the board, particularly for mobile devices. So your sources are what are impacted. So if it's your website, your customer list, if you're uploading data into um, be it an email list or just tracking people who've hit your website, if they've opted out of tracking, they've opted out of your sources essentially. Um, but what's quite interesting and what I've started doing a lot to get continue getting traction for clients on, on the platform is using Facebook sources because it's on platform data. A user who takes an action on the platform is fine. It's when, it's when they leave the platform. So if you've had a really high performing video, you can create an audience based off that. If you have like really good organic followers on Instagram that are highly engaged, you can create, um, you can create audiences from those lookalikes. You can use all of these data sources quite effectively. So I would just bear that in mind that if you could just draw a little line through the middle here, your sources are impacted, Facebook sources are not. Um, and that's just as a result of iOS 14. I expect Facebook will start getting a little bit more um, savvy with how they're going to target people over time, but it's just not quite there yet. Then you have your Google Ads side of things. So you can import all your data in here as well. So tracking and data are your two key starting points. This is a screen grab from Google Ads. And again, you can see here um, the example data points that you could put in. One of my favorite ones here inside in Google Ads is this option here. And it's it can go a little bit unnoticed, but people who browse types of websites and people who use types of apps. And what's interesting is that you can select those options and put in the URLs of your competitors or apps that are relevant to your business. Um, people who visited certain places isn't the best because a lot of people have location tracking off anyway, so it doesn't really matter that much. But um, if you're doing anything with your competitor audiences on Google in particular, uh, a nice little tip there is go through to their add to cart pages or try to get through to their endpoint and put those URLs in because if you put in their home pages, you don't know what their bounce rate is like. You don't know if they're getting crappy traffic, but if you go further towards their endpoint, at least you have a gauge on a little bit of better quality there as well. If you have a e-commerce store, I would highly recommend uh, using the commerce manager here in Facebook. This is a screen grab from Facebook and synchronize your store accordingly so that all your products are synchronized. That way you can use the catalog features um, fairly effectively and typically it synchronizes the tracking quite well as well. Um, 
I'll, despite the iOS 14 changes, it, it it is a little finicky across the board at the moment, but best practice for e-commerce would also be to import those in here as well. Import it in, in its full. You can always segment it afterwards. They make ad sets of different types of products that you sell. Um, and it's also really handy for things like upselling. So for example, if you sold cameras, uh, you could have an ad set of cameras. They're rolling out. Pe- as people buy them, you could say, okay, anyone who has purchased a camera, now upsell them with, with a lens or the camera bag or something afterwards. So you can start structuring your products more effectively. Again, um, with iOS 14, that, 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 is, that is impacted as well, but you can do it to a degree for now, especially on uh, desktop users. The next thing to really think about is, okay, you have your data in place. You're looking at importing everything you can to Facebook and and Google, and the next thing really is to kind of start thinking about your KPIs. Um, CPM is your cost per thousand. So that means how expensive is it to get in front of a thousand people? Now, what you want to consider all the time with these platforms is that they are essentially they're addictive attention-based apps. So what they are trying to do to the user consistently is hold their, hold their attention for as much as possible. If your advert isn't holding attention, they're going to charge you more for the luxury of being there. So if your advert isn't resonating, your CPM is going to go up. (coughs) Excuse me. Your click-through rate then, how willing are people um, to click on your advert? And then if there's an issue with that, is your call to action okay? So all of these different metrics kind of give you a gauge on what it should be and what you may need to change. Your CPC, how many people click on the advert? And I always say in this one, is it your campaign goal to get a link click? Primarily because Facebook in particular, a click is any kind of touch of the advert whatsoever. And it's very different to a landing page view. A link click does not mean someone went to your website. They might have hit the see more button to read more of the text. They might have clicked it to watch the video. They may have clicked it and just X right back out and never hit your website. So your cost per link click and landing page view are two very different things. So your landing page view, then LPV, how many people actually ended up on your website? And is this hugely different from, sorry, that should say um, CPC. So your landing page view should be more expensive than your cost per click, absolutely. But if it's drastically different, I'd be looking into if you have a speed problem there, how long is that click actually taking from someone clicking to getting to the website? It is perfectly normal though to see a thousand clicks and... 500 landing page views that is actually pretty normal but where if you saw like a thousand clicks and maybe 200 landing page views i'd be starting to get concerned um your cpa then how much it's going to cost you to acquire a customer are your early impact what you want to be looking at there if there's issues is are your early metrics impacting so is your cpm astronomical and then having the impact of not as many people clicking through all of these kind of domino effect down on each other so you want to look at all of these back to back your CAC then, what is your actual cost? So are you looking at ad spend? Have you hired someone to run these ads? What are what are other costs impacting this campaign other than your advertising spend? I factor those into CAC uh, as well. LTV, we're all familiar with the lifetime um, value. So if it's costing you $20 to get a customer and you have a subscription that's $7, you wanna make sure that they're lasting at least four months to make some bit of profit off it. Then your frequency, how often are people seeing your adverts? You do want to keep an eye on your frequency, especially with remarketing campaigns, particularly since the iOS changes, because those um, those audience sizes are actually much, much smaller than they were before. And in that instance, you want to change your creatives. Um, people experience ad blindness. It's perfectly normal. If I said to any of you to tell, to tell me the last advert you saw on Facebook or Instagram, you probably couldn't tell me, even though you see one in every four posts. So it's it, being blind to adverts is is normal, um, but particularly if people are seeing it over and over again. When it comes to structuring uh, campaigns, so this is a screenshot from Facebook. You may be familiar f- with it if you've ever hit, just hit the create campaign button. And I've added in these cold, warm, hot, low intent, medium intent and high intent markers here because typically that's what they are. Whatever option you select here, the KPI associated with that campaign structure is going to be the lowest cost and everything else in the mix is going to be higher cost. So if you select brand awareness, your CPM is going to look fantastic, but your conversion rate is going to look really bad. 
if you select conversions, um, you're going to have the opposite essentially where your CPM is a little bit higher. Your click through rate is a little potentially, um, your click through rate should be good, but your landing page view and your conversion rate typically end up being less expensive in the end because you've optimized for a higher intent. So your awareness could get in front of people all day long and just get nowhere in terms of conversions. Equally, your traffic campaign, um, it's clicks. Again, it's it's not optimized. You have to force it to optimize for landing page views, which is a finicky setup in of itself. But the other thing to factor in here is that after the iOS changes, sometimes you want to leverage some of the lower and medium intent uh, campaigns to get on platform data now. So for example, um, in the consideration, often a campaign structure that I use at the moment is a video view. I have a longer video that's maybe two to three minutes, really strong kind of brand story or something like that. And then I track people who've watched 75% or more and drive them into a conversion campaign because you're you're struggling with data. Like before I would have just said lookalikes and you know, maybe test some broad audiences and 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 really drive into conversions. Whereas now you have to kind of think about the step of the platform data as well that it has, which is the 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 impact of iOS 14 essentially. But typically even still vast majority of the campaigns I run are in the conversion market. Um, because what you can actually do as well is if you select conversions in your ad set, the next step after this, you can say, okay, well, I want impressions or I want landing page views or I want conversions. You still have the option to kind of be a bit more retrospective. The other thing to factor in as well is that Facebook understands people's behavior. If someone, um, say if I scroll through Facebook and I typically scroll like, scroll I like that, scroll and I hit the like button a lot, I'm likely going to be seeing, being shown ads um, for people who are looking for engagement because it's my behavior to do that anyway. Whereas say if Craig, for example, was the type of person to go through Facebook and look at video views and, and, and really watch videos, he's more likely to see that. So sometimes it's behavioral and th that's where it gets tricky with Facebook. That's why those conversion campaigns typically are better. Google, the exact same, you have this option as well where you're looking at sales leads, website traffic. You're again, structuring your campaign for your actual goal. Always structure your campaign with what you actually want because what you select is what you're gonna get. Now, the other thing with Google Ads to factor in is that typically it you also need to factor in your bidding strategy as well because say, for example, you want sales and then you optimize it for maximum impressions, you're going to you're going to have an issue there as well. So if it's sales, that'd be maximized conversions. You know, align your structures um, with your actual goals across the board. You can also do geotargeting on Facebook. This is an interesting concept where you can use the exclude button. Um, so the blue circle here is um, Cork City Council. This is just an example. And then I used exclude marks to exclude all the areas around it, just so it's honing in on that building primarily. Case uses for this is in, I guess in real life, if you're a company that um, has trade shows, car shows, events, weddings, um, or, or wedding shows, um, anything like that. Or if you've just had a really high ticket meeting in an office and you just want them to see testimonials, I'd be using this as well. Advertising placement is the next thing to really look at. Um, so on the left here is Facebook, on the right here is Google Ads. And again, you want to be thinking about where you're gonna place your adverts. So typically, and you can see the three boxes I have ticked here, vast majority of conversions for people I have worked with ha come from these. Interestingly, the Instagram or typically the Facebook feed is the highest converting. And that's a very generic thing for me to say. It's different for every company, but primarily that's what I see. But actually Instagram's really picking up pace at the moment. Um, I have a theory that I haven't confirmed yet, but I think more people are opting out of tracking on Facebook than they are Instagram, despite them being the same company. Um, but I think that's why it's picking up a little bit more on Instagram. Um, reels is an option now as well to really consider. The one thing I would consider is removing your adverts from places that highly irritate people. Um, for example, in stream is one. So if someone's trying to watch something and the ad pops up in the middle, it's actually just really frustrating. Nobody wants to see it there. If someone's reading an article, they don't want to see your ad in the middle of it. They just, and you can, it's very difficult to align it with the correct article as well. And the other really really important one that I always tell people to try to exclude unless they have an app is apps and sites because this is actually completely off Facebook. 
this isn't even on Facebook anymore. And then if you're using that and you're using automatic placements, for example, you want to have a brand safety strategy in place and you want to have make sure that you're excluding things that you don't want your ad to be placed on. Equally over here on Google Ads, search, display, shopping, video, discovery. Search is going to be the highest intent. Display is going to be the weakest. Shopping is up there with search, realistically. Video is YouTube. And discovery is just a mixture of everything. Um, so you just want to really factor in what kind of campaign type you want, where you want, where you actually want the ads placed. It's not just about the platform. There's there's actually layers to the placements inside there as well. So just factor those in as well. You can also do lots of early creative testing on Facebook. Um, so there's this option here in the ad set called Dynamic Creative that you can turn on and you get the option to select multiple images, multiple videos, multiple text multiple URL or sorry, just the one URL, but multiple um, descriptions, headlines, texts and creatives. And what you get the opportunity to do is Facebook essentially mix and matches those options to best suit the user. Um, I find this a great solution for people who are just starting with adverts and don't want to dive straight into A-B split testing and spending a ton of money on those kind of tests. Typically, these come out from with the same answer from my tests in the past as well. So it's a really good way to figure it out. And you can look at the breakdown afterwards of which which variation performed the best. Here are some examples of high performance creatives on um, on Facebook. The one over here on the left, again, just driving people into a trial like Miro. Again, the middle one, driving people into a trial. What you'll notice here is that um, the one on the left over here, this advert was running for about nine months and it was the highest performing advert for that period of time. And again, the opening line is probably all people really saw. Start your fitness journey with my seven day free trial. Again, down here, seven day free trial, get offer. You're just trying to get them into that seven day free trial. Over here in the middle, five gold stars and a testimonial. I find that really works all the time as well. It's just, it's just one of my go-to ad copies at this point. And again, start your free trial. Emojis tend to bring these out a bit as well. And this one over here on the right, that's actually a three and a half minute video. And I found it really successful for structuring data at the moment with iOS 14. Um, long form video worked really well. And the audience that we retargeted based on that on platform data was was just really highly engaged after it. There was, there was a good conversion rate off the back of it. Um, so I'd highly recommend thinking about your creative slightly different. All along, it's been short, snappy, short, snappy. But actually, if people are in, people don't have a bad attention span. I think that's a little bit of a myth. Like all of us will happily sit down and binge watch nine hours of Netflix if given the opportunity. We have an attention span. It's just whether it's interesting or not. And that's what actually captures attention. You can also um, go find high performance creatives. So um, Facebook ads library, you can go in, put in a particular brand and you can search for it. Black Friday is coming up. If anyone's doing um, some online shopping, put in the company that you're looking for. You'll likely find their discount code there too. It's a handy little tip. Um, but more importantly, uh, you can also look at your competitors' ads. What I would like, what I like to do here as well is um, keep a track of what ads my competitors are running, so that over time I can be like, oh, they got rid of that ad, so it mustn't have been working. Oh, but that ad is still there, and it's three months later. That variation must be working, so I can learn from their adverts as well. This is what it looks like on Google Ads. You don't have much room for creative with the exception of your ad copy. So this is just an example of Air Jordans. It just pulls in the image that is on your site. You're not allowed to have overlays. It has to be very particular. So there's nothing major you can do creative wise for shopping campaigns. But down here, this is where you get the opportunity to stand out. So for example, here, I'm kind of surprised at how bad the Nike advert is compared to the ASOS one. Fill out all your information. They've only just used a line and one description, which is unusual. But anyway, to fill it all out, get as much information in there as possible. Um, get the most out of your ad copy if that's all you have, which is all you have in search. And it's probably the highest performing um, one if you have a problem solution in the sense that someone knows to search for your solution. It's likely going to be the highest intent. Message matching again with Google ads. If someone searches for Air Jordans, you want to make sure that there's Air Jordans actually in your ad in the copy and also on the landing page because this bar over here is your quality score. And if you can get a 10 out of 10, your cost per click and your cost per conversion go way 
down it is just probably the most important element of google ads because it's not just a bidding platform if i bid one euro or one dollar and craig bid two dollars on a advert but craig's website was bad and mine was good i could get that number one position for um for having the higher quality score in that instance and end up paying less for it even though craig is willing to pay more in that instance so keep an eye on your quality score you also want to check your analytics. So this is a screenshot of Google Analytics. You want to go in there. You want to go to audience. If you're using the um, universal analytics, it's uh, slightly different in um, GA4, but you'll be able to find it anyway under mobile and devices. And if you haven't checked yet, just take a little look for yourself and see just how many of your users are actually coming through from iPhone, just so you can get a gauge on the level of impact that the iOS is going to have on your business if you haven't yet. Then in Facebook, it's the core place where there's issues. Yes, there is, is issues on remarketing on Google ads as well, but the primary place of issue is on Facebook, particularly in the US, because I think it's averaging only four in a hundred people are opting in for tracking. So that's, oh, that's, that's, that's crazy though. That, that's, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's about 12% worldwide, but the US in particular is very low. Um, and that's again on the back of, I mean, Facebook has its own privacy issues that it's been battling with in the public um, for a long time now when people ha do have trust issues with Facebook. Um, so you do see that reflected in the iOS changes now as well. But here with the event priorita prioritization to try to track as best possible, Facebook has this um, aggregated event management system in place where you need to verify your domain and you need to allocate what purchases or sorry, allocate what conversions you want. In order, you have eight um, spots to fill and you need to set them to highest to lowest priority. The highest priority, like in this example here, is just going to be purchase, then add to cart, then view content. Kind of makes sense in an e-commerce structure, but if your business is slightly different, you may need to prioritize those. For example, for us, we have the highest priority being membership. Well, we had the highest priority being membership at the start. And then we realized that actually lead velocity was more important to us, even though it wasn't the highest priority. But on Facebook, we wanted it to be the highest priority because we wanted to, to pull in as many of those as possible. What essentially happens in this instance is potentially the purchase is recorded back to you, but maybe not the add to cart. Um, so it's prioritizing what information you see. Um, so it's really important to f fill it out accurately. But if you like, I've changed these a few times and it, it doesn't really make a huge difference, but you'd want to play around with it and think about it in line with your business. The other thing as well that to factor in is that if you go in and move these around, any campaign that's using that conversion event, like as a, as a goal will be paused for 72 hours in a review process. So plan it plan it in advance. If you have this already set up and you need to change it, plan that change. Otherwise you're going to potentially lose out in 72 hours of adverts running. UTM parameters are the next thing you really need to think about. UTM parameters are little tags that you can add to your URL. If you just Google UTM parameter tool, there's tons of them out there. Um, I recommend Google's one. And then when someone clicks on it, it essentially adds these little things to the end of your URL. And what happens is it feeds that data back into Google Analytics. It's really important because right now there's issues with Facebook's data and Google Analytics is really, really bad at tracking data from Facebook. Uh, more often than not, it marks it as direct instead of social. Um, but your UTM parameters will tell you what it is or where it came from. So you can be really specific. Um, recently, I did UTM parameters for someone who wanted it to like I want to know the exact keyword that person said right through to if they converted. And you can do that with UTM parameters on Google, Facebook, anywhere. Um, I also recommend, and I've started layering it in even for us, um, to start thinking about UTM parameters for even your organic and your content side of things as well. So just bear that in mind as well.